our church is doing uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting, so I hope you're joining us in that. There's some guides over at Next Steps that help you kind of guide through those 21 days of prayer and fasting. Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Uh, when Pastor asked me to speak, um, I wasn't sure what to talk about, and there's a very short sentence on prayer in 1 Thessalonians that we're going to talk about today. It's going to be on the screens. This is what it says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. That's it, three words. In a different version, it's two words, and it says pray continually. And while it sounds really simple and it sounds really easy, uh, I think it can prove to be uh, quite difficult. Uh, I wanna put a picture of my family up on the screen. Uh, I get to be on staff here. This is my wife, Tyler, and then oldest to youngest, that's Thatcher, Jetson, Riggins and Weber is our baby. And um, the, the, we had some family pictures taken. This was, believe it or not, the sad looking kids on the bottom. That's as, as happy as they looked in this pose. That's the best that we could do. Um, the, 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 the bottom lip out, he wasn't sad about anything. It was just like, hey, we're gonna take a picture. Bottom lip went out, looked sad. Um, Riggins is our three-year-old. He's a ton of fun. That's probably my favorite age because they're, they're starting to learn to communicate, but not everything is communicated uh, well. Uh, but, the, you know, their personality is coming out. You can see kind of who they are and their desires and their wants. And Riggins is funny, our, our three-year-old, because he uh, always wants a snack. I don't think there's ever a time in the day uh, that he does not want to eat some kind of snack. Um, at mealtime, He'll take a bite or two, uh, but when it's snack time, he comes alive. Um, and he will come and ask anybody and everybody for a snack. Um, if you've been around the church, sometimes like there's some snacks in the office, and as we're leaving the, the church, I'll let the boys each get one snack. And a lot of times, uh, I'll tell them like, hey, once we get to the car, I'll open it up for you. Because once you open up the, the snack, the miles per hour of Riggins goes way down. Um, he just stops moving as quickly. He has what he wants, so he's not moving anymore. Um, so he's just slowing down eating. So I'll tell them, once we get to the car, we'll open up the snack. And we'll be walking to the car, and we're a long, slow train, so I'm trying to get all of them to the car. And before I know it, this has happened so many times, and it's probably happened to some of you. I'll turn around, and Riggins will have found someone, sometimes a stranger, and he'll go, open my snack? And he'll find someone to open that snack for him and get them to open it up. And he'll, thank you. And he's so cute and he's so winsome that it's like, oh, man, I wish you wouldn't have done that, kid. Uh, but he finds a way to get what he wants, even with his limited communication abilities. Um, one of my favorite things that happened last year when he was just two, my wife made, right before Christmas, made this big batch of fudge. Um, and she makes, uh, you know, great snacks, great desserts, great Christmas cookies. So it kind of sat up on our counter next to our fridge, and he knew that he could have fudge maybe after dinner time. We'd give him a piece or two, and that would be kind of his snack. Well, every time that somebody would come over to our house, he would greet them, grab them by the hand, pull them over close to our fridge and go, fudge? You want some fudge? And he knew that without a doubt, when they, when they got some fudge, he would get some fudge. He knew how to ask what he wanted, what he needed, what his desires were based on his limited ability to communicate. And I think prayer sometimes is, is, is that way. It should be our ability to communicate with a strong and powerful, authoritative and loving God the things that we want, the things that we need, the things that we see don't line up in our lives with God's word. But I think if you're honest here, you'd probably be like, my prayer life may not be where it should be. Maybe you're here and you're like, man, I just, I lose focus. Like we're in 21 days of prayer and fasting and you're like, there's like four things to pray for. And you're like, I got it. Prayed for it. What now? Or maybe you start praying for a thing and you start to lose focus and you're like, what, what were we even talking about? That prayer request that you had that you brought before God now turns into a to-do list and you're doing something about it, right? And it goes from a prayer to something that you need to do. Or maybe you've heard other people pray in church and it's like, man, they're like good at it. They're like a good prayer. And I don't know how to pray. Like they're using these and thous and they're like quoting scripture and they're like quoting scripture back to God and you're like, God probably seems pretty impressed with that. Like that. they're good at praying. And I just don't have it so like, 
I'm just not gonna do it. Your confidence drops because you're not able to pray like other people pray. Or maybe you lack the energy or the faith. And I say that and you're like, I don't really lack the faith. Maybe you've prayed for something for a long time and nothing has happened. Maybe you have a loved one who's not a believer, who really needs Christ, and their life is difficult and their life is hard, and you know that removing difficulty is not the answer, it's Jesus, and it seems like things just keep getting further away from them knowing Christ. Maybe there's a situation in your family, relational tension, something that's hard, that's not right, that you know it just feels tense, and you're like, God, I've prayed for it for a long time and it doesn't seem like anything is ever actually getting better. It's actually getting worse. So you lack the faith, you throw up your hands and you say, God is sovereign. Whatever he wants to happen will happen. And our prayer life ends up not being what we want it to be, what we need it to be. So when we read this short passage, pray without ceasing or pray continually, Why do we need to pray continually? Why do we need to pray without ceasing? What's the importance of it? I think the first thing is because God is the one who can help. God is the one who can help. In Isaiah 40, it says this. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely is their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them, and they wither, and their tempest carries them off like stubble. What he's saying here is the biggest powers to be, at, to be at the earth, the rulers, the princes, the people that are established authority. He's saying God sits above the galaxy. He blows on them, and they go away the powers that have been there for centuries that we go, that's an establishment that's not moving. God holds the authority over that thing. God is powerful. God is strong. God knows the ins and the outs of every situation and he controls it. Later on in verse 28, it says, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Our God is powerful. Our God is strong. He's everlasting. He's the creator. His knowledge is unsearchable. His power is so much that when he died on the cross, he died for every sin, past, present, and future. There is nothing that isn't under the blood of the cross if we bring it to him in humility. He's powerful. There's no situation that's too far gone. There's no thing that's too difficult. God has power. God is strong. God is able. Is that the God that you pray to? Do you, is is this, practically, is this the God that you pray to? Do you show up to pray to God and you go, God, I'm, I'm acknowledging that you are powerful? Or do you show up to God and go, my commute's not looking too good. God, if you could come through for me, it would be really nice for me. I think a big piece of prayer that we miss is God's authority and his power. He's strong, he's powerful, and he's able. That's the second thing. He's not just powerful. He is the one who can help. He wants to hear from you. God wants to hear from you. Sometimes people in authority don't want to hear from you. I remember when I was a kid, my mom told me that if, if we did like a little project and we sent a letter to the president, at the time it was George W. Bush, we sent a letter to George W. Bush and I got a letter back and I was like, this is amazing. The president of the United States took the time and wrote me back. And I remember telling someone about it and they went, that was a staff member. And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I wrote the president And he wrote me back, it was signed, and they were like, well, maybe he signed it, but also maybe somebody stamped it. 
We know that authority doesn't always communicate, but we serve a God who wants to hear from us. He has both the authority and power and the desire. He loves you like a father loves a child. James 5, 13 through 15. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. There's nothing that God doesn't want to hear about from your day. There's nothing that God says, oh, that's too small. Jeremiah 29, 13 talks about how if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us and he will forgive us and he will heal our lands. It's not just that he has the authority, he has the love of a father to be there for us. I think sometimes we assume that God's a little annoyed at us. Because when someone comes to you with something that they've done wrong or their attitude's not just right or something, something's a little off, you come in and you go, here's Jared again. Hi, Jared. How are you? Yeah. Yep, it's good to see you. And I walk away and you go, man, that dude's so annoying. <laughs> Why? Because people are messy. People are difficult. People aren't easy to deal with. So we assume that God takes the same attitude towards us, but that's just not the case. God is a loving father who cares for you and loves you so much. Um, one of the, the, the books that, that we're kind of doing along with this, 20, 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting, A Praying Life by Paul Miller, one of the chapters he talks about how it's a childlike faith. And when we have a childlike faith, we assume that childlike things come along with it. So my kids don't communicate clearly and well 100% of the time. My three-year-old is getting better at enunciating words, at sentence structure, but he still says things incorrectly. Our one-year-old, last night, we put all of, our, all of our older three boys down and our one-year-old was still awake for a little bit and we just sat with him and he played with a toy and he's in the babbling stage. So he's just saying nonsense and he's using different tones and he's, he's just, it's so exciting. And everything that he said, me and my wife were going, oh yeah, and we're mimicking it, right? You know what we don't do when a child comes to us and something's not quite right? And they say, I'm hurt, hurt, dad. We don't come up and say, okay, the sentence structure was a little off. Um, th that's not how you phrase it. We don't come in and go, hey, I'm dad, and I'm busy, and I'm doing our budget, and, and you need to respect my authority. We go, no, you're my child. You don't understand all the things that I have going on. I'm just glad that you run to me. That's God. That's the heart of our father. He says, I'm your father. So his heart is that you would just run to him. Tim Keller tells a story about John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was president in the early 60s when um, they, were, they had the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, probably one of the, the biggest what-ifs of the, the, the former regime that nuclear war, possible, I mean, awful things could have happened. And there's a story of him meeting with advisors and generals. I mean, truly the fate of the world was at hand when John F. Kennedy Jr., two years old, walks in the Oval Office. And instead of saying, hey bud, dad, the most important person in the world, is doing some of the most important work in the world, you need to go back outside, he stopped what he was doing. The advisors waited, the generals waited, and he got down on his knees and he said, what do you need, buddy? And he listened to whatever it was that two-year-old had to say. And he listened to him, and he cared for him, and he was with him. And when John F. Kennedy Jr. was done talking to his father, dad said, okay, I'm gonna go back to work. He sent him away, and he got back to things. We serve a God who's more powerful than the president. We serve a God who sits above the circle of the earth, who breathes and powers fall, lifts us up and sustains us. And he loves us with this love. He doesn't send us away. 
He doesn't say come back with the right attitude. He doesn't say come back with the right tone. He doesn't say, God is just happy you're running to him. Now, I do think that there's something that we need to learn that's the spectrum of God has authority and he is powerful and he calls us friend, but sometimes I think we can get too casual with God. We need to treat him as such. God has the power, God has the authority. But thirdly, consistency grows dependence. Consistency grows dependence. Think about this with any relationship that you're in. If there's even a work relationship, someone that you may not have chosen to spend all of your time with, but because you're with them so often, there's things that you know that they care about. There's things that you know that they're excited about. There's things that you know are going on in their lives. That There's dependence there on each other. Why? Because you're consistent. You're around each other all the time. I want to show you the rest of what's around uh, that verse in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to start in verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. He says, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always, listen to some of these words that he uses to describe what we should be as, as believers. But always seek to do good in one, to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of of God in Christ Jesus for you. The, the, the crazy thing about all of these things, you can't do them. I can't do them on my own. I can't do good for someone in every circumstance. I can't rejoice in every circumstance. You know what I have to do? I have to come to the feet of the Father and say, God, I can't do this on my own. God, this is not a circumstance that I want to rejoice in. Maybe some of you have some circumstances that you're like, rejoice in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to rejoice always. This is not easy. We're only able to do those those things, have that attitude, because we have a God who sustains us, who is good. And what's wild about these is we see these hard things, and we're like, "I, I just don't understand how it could happen. I don't understand how you could be looking at an impossible situation and ask God for something else. But Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was looking at an impossible situation of him going to the cross and dying an excruciating death, and he asked God if there was another way. He brought his impossible situation to God and said, I I, I don't know how to do it. I don't think, I, I don't want to. But he brought so much to God. And, and Jesus was known as someone who would disconnect from everything else and show up alone with his father. God, I need you. Consistency breeds dependence. And the heart of the Christian faith is dependence. It's not something that we add on to our lives because God would make our lives a little bit better. The, the, the story of faith, the story of Jesus is that you and I are not capable. We're dead in our sins, but God, who's rich in mercy because of his, because of his great love, with, which with he loved us, died for us, made us alive together with him. So now we're dead to our old lives and we're alive in him. He's the only way that we get life. So we pray consistently. We pray with urgency. God has the power, the the ability, and the desire, so we show up to him consistently. And you're like, okay, that sounds really good. I understand all of that. I agree with it. God's powerful. God has the desires. I, I don't know practically how to do it. How do I pray continually? How do I pray constantly? How do I just be in this all the time? I think when I first heard this, I thought that it was like, I'm always in a conversation with God and anything else is an interruption. Um, there's, there's a popular show where there, there's a couple that are dating and uh, they go and work at two different branches of the same company and they find these little headsets and they wear them all day long with each other so they're constantly on the phone with each other. And anybody walks up to them and they're like, hey, I had this question and they're like answering the, the question that they had on the phone and everything's an interruption to their conversation and it seems like, chaos everywhere, but that isn't in the conversation. And that's what I thought praying constantly was. I'm always in conversation with God. Everything else is an interruption. But the word continually, the word without ceasing, it, what, the, what the word talks about is the initial, sorry, the, 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 the Greek, what it talks about is this thing that won't go away. It's the same word that they use for a cough, something that you keep returning to, something that's happening often, something that keeps repeating. 
It's part of what you do. It's consistent. It's constancy. It's part of who you are. You will return to it. A cough is that way. Something you keep returning to, part of who you are. So how do we pray continually? What are the practical aspects of this? How do we pray continually, often consistent? One, I think we have to determine to pray. We have to decide that we're gonna pray. We have to, to know that that's what we're going to do. Philippians 4, 6 through 8, you've probably heard this before. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, which means asking and begging God. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And I wanna stop right there. Because even that alone is obedience. But the promise of, chap- of verse 7 is incredible. It says, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So it says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, ask and tell God what's going on. Which is a wild thought. Because what he's basically saying is if anything makes you anxious, if anything makes you nervous, if anything is a worry to you, bring it to God. What he's basically saying is let your worries, let your anxiety be the bridge to prayer. And what if that was so constant in your life? I worry, I pray. I think about something too long, I pray. I get anxious about something, I pray. I think Satan's gonna start to be careful how he introduces anxiety into your life. I think it's gonna grow. As someone who can worry about a lot of different things, I think it's grown my prayer life. But I think we have to predetermine those, those things. To know that, okay, at the beginning of the day, God, as things come up, I'm going to pray to you. So as things happen, I pray. It doesn't have to be anything special. It doesn't have to be anything important. Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. With confidence, we draw near. In those days, there was the attitude of like, if there was a king, you don't draw near unless you are invited. But what the argument here is that we draw near with boldness and confidence because of our relationship with the king. And what it says in Philippians is that we, we let it be known. Let your request be made known to God. What that's not saying is like coming up to God and going, God, this morning, uh, my car started really slowly because of how cold it was, and it made me start thinking the battery might be old. And then I started thinking about when it's going to die and when I'm going to have to go out outside in the freezing cold, and my battery's dead, and I'm going to have to find somebody to jump it. And if it, if it doesn't jump, then I'm going to have to take it to O'Reilly's, and then I'm going to have to buy a new battery, and that's going to be kind of a lot of money. And... It says, just let them be known to God. The same way that my children let their requests be made known to me, let your requests be made known to God. They don't have to be well-worded. They don't have to be clean. They don't have to have these and thous. They don't have to be done in cursive, okay? You can just say, God, I'm worried about my battery. God, I'm worried about my son. God, I'm worried about this situation. God, I don't know what to do about this situation. I need you. Let your request be made known to God. The word picture there is let the words fall out of your mouth. It doesn't have to be clean. It doesn't have to be perfect. God loves you so much. He's not sitting in heaven with his arms crossed going, that sentence structure wasn't right. He's sitting there going, yes, come to me. I have the power, the desire, and the ability. Come to me. Come to me. Go to God with everything. But we have to determine to pray. We have to decide ahead of time. We have to stop the cycles of those barriers. And maybe you're here and you're like, I've prayed for one thing for a long time, and I don't know that I can do it any longer. Colossians 1.29 says, For this I toil, struggling with all this energy that he powerfully works within me, and it's talking about the Holy Spirit. We have to let the Holy Spirit prompt us to pray, to push us to pray. And I think we need to have this attitude of like, I'm not just gonna wait. I'm not gonna wait until the moment is clean. I'm not gonna wait until I can get in my spot. I'm gonna just pray now. However it needs to look, I'm gonna pray now. When someone comes to me with an issue, I'm gonna go, can we pray about it? And if they say no, I'm still gonna pray about it. I'm gonna choose to pray. 
I'm going to change the culture of my home. I'm going to change the culture of my workplace. I'm going to pray however it needs to look. I'm going to pray now. And we commit to it. We're dedicated to the, to the idea of praying now. Praying hard things. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. Those things that, the desires, the hurts, the pains, that you don't even know how to vocalize, it says that God knows. The Spirit takes them to the Father for us. So we have to determine to pray. Secondly, we have to pray like never before. Be consistent. Keep showing up. Pastor Eddie read, read the verse last week that was talking about how if someone comes to your door and asks you for a loaf of bread, you'll tell him no because it's midnight. But if he keeps asking, you will tell him yes just to get him away from you. And I'm reading through the, the, the Old Testament and I'm reading about Moses and his intimate relationship with God and there were things that Moses brought to God consistently that God would go, okay, Moses, because you're asking, I'll do it. Why? Because he had such a relationship with him. He was so consistent. He brought so much to him on a consistent basis. It changed things. Be consistent. Keep returning. Don't let the barriers of normal life stop you from praying. When you think about what stops you from praying, it's probably just regular, not bad things. Busyness, your job, your house, your kids. Um, just regular busyness of life. None of those are bad things. So I can't sit here and tell you, get rid of all the extra so that you can pray more. No, you shouldn't get rid of your kids. You should love your kids and treat them well. But we need to let those things be bridges to prayer. Man, my kids need so much right now. That three-year-old needs so much time. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray for him. Doesn't have to be clean. Doesn't have to be well thought. I'm gonna pray for my three-year-old. I'm gonna pray for my energy. I'm gonna pray for his heart towards God. I pray that this little moment that we're thinking through would matter. Keep returning to it. Make it a priority. Matthew 6, 6 through 7 says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret, and your father who's in secret will reward you. I think we need to have both ends of the spectrum. We need to have those prayers that you just, they're always flying in the back of your head. I'm worried about this. This is what's happening. This is what's going on. We also need to be dedicated to it. God is a powerful God who deserves our attention and deserves our focus. So have a spot. In Daniel, it says that as soon as he heard the decree that no one should pray to anyone but the king, he went back to his house and he prayed in the three, three times in his window how he normally prays. He had a spot where he prayed every single day. Do you have a spot? Use the times that you already have. I remember when I started deciding, I'm gonna pray out loud. I'm gonna change up the methods. I'm gonna pray out loud. I'm gonna pray in my car. And I thought, you know what? People will just think I'm, I'm talking on my Bluetooth on my way to work. But in a 03 Corolla, nobody really believes that you're talking on your Bluetooth. They just assume you're a little bit crazy. But you know what? No one ever said anything to me about it. Pray out loud to God. Change up the method. Go for a walk with God. Change your physical posture. Journal to God. I'm not much of a journaler. I'm not like writing every day to God. But sometimes when I'm just, I don't know how to phrase things, I just start writing it. So my journal ends up being the real low of lows, and sometimes it's hard to open the journal, and it's like, man, there's a lot of sad days in here. But then it's cool to go back and see how God has answered some of those prayers time after time, how God has been so good. Change up the method. Ask someone to pray for you. Pray for someone else. That's why groups are so important, because we all have things we need to pray for, and the prayer of a righteous man does much good. There's a, there, there's a method, if you've never prayed before, and you're like, I just don't understand. This method follows the Lord's prayer. Father, Father out in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This, this method follows that. And it's called the Acts method. A is for adoration. We adore God. We tell him who he is. We, thank, we, we tell him, God, you're powerful, you're strong, you're mighty, you're able. You saved me. 
Confession, we tell God what's in our hearts. We tell God what we've done. We get clean with God. Think about that in any other relationship. If there's something between you and that person, you need to clear it up before things are good. Thanksgiving, you thank God for all the things that you have. In supplication, you ask God for what's there, acts. Identify your barriers. What stops you from praying? We talked about those simple daily things, but I think sometimes there's also sin And sometimes we let that sin, instead of letting us run to God with it, we hide it. And we sin more. When ultimately God knows and he loves us. He's still there for you. And lastly, how do we pray continually? We determine to pray. We pray like never before. And I think we tell him everything. We tell him everything. I think there's something special about coming completely clean before God, about being fully transparent and being frequent in it. I think if there was a person that was walking this earth that you told everything to and you did that on a consistent basis, I think you are gonna be good friends with that person. Why? Transparency and frequency builds intimacy. I think sometimes we look at our relationship with God and we go, God, I don't really know why I'm not close to you. Have you told him anything that's really going on in your life? And have you done it two days in a row? Have you done it today? And I think doing that over a long period of time is gonna be a special thing. Even seeing what God's word has to say and saying, God, I don't, I don't see how this matches up. Will you help me do this? I think God honors those desires of, God, I wanna honor you. I wanna live my life for you. There was a na- man named George Mueller who ran orphanages in Britain in the 1800s. And they said that there were over 10,000 orphans that have been through his orphanages in the years that he was operating them. And he was, a man, he was known as a man of great faith. And uh, one, of the, one of the famous stories uh, of George Mueller's faith is that he, he would pray so consistently and, and had such great faith in God. There were 300 orphans one day at this orphanage that he, this orphanage that he was at, and they had run out of food completely. And the, the head of the orphanage came to him and said, there's 300 orphans, they're getting dressed right now, there's no food for the day, what do you want us to do? And he said, have them get dressed, have them sit at the table, and we'll pray. And he said he had them sit there, and he just sat and prayed, and he told the staff to pray. No food in the orphanage, 300 people. He said not a couple minutes after they started praying, there was a knock at the door. And George Mueller went and answered the door and it was a baker and he, the baker said, I just, God put it on my heart that I should wake up early when I normally do my baking and instead of doing my normal baking, I need to bake three batches just for you in the orphanage. Will you accept it? Yeah. So there was bread, there was food. He said not just a couple minutes later, a horse-drawn milkman knocked on his door and said, my cart broke not too far from your entrance. I can't do anything with the milk. Would you all take the supply? And he said, yes. And God provided. And there's actually, if you just search on Google, George Mueller prayer, um, the the Bible Moody Institute um, has a book that they've made. It's about 80 pages. It's not very long, but it just has sections of his prayer journal where he prayed for something and it happened. And God answered and God provided. And it's cool to just go through and see the date, what he prayed for, and see how God provided. Because sometimes God provided right at what he asked for. Sometimes God provided from left field. Sometimes God provided from way above what he ever asked. But upon his death, they found his journals. And they counted and there were 50,000 answered prayers over his 60 year walk with God. That was almost 800 a year, almost over one a day. Most of these were things, because he would write down, God, I'm praying for this, and then he would write down how it was answered or when it was, pray- when, when it was answered. He 
He had a life of faith. He had a life of showing up and saying, God, these are my needs. These are my desires. I wanna build a new orphanage, but I don't have the funds. I need to feed, I need to, he would just come to God with his needs. And now because of his faithfulness, we get to see how our God is good. He has the desire to help us and he cares for us. What will be said of your life of faith? What will be said of your prayer life? It doesn't have to be complicated, but it can be consistent. It can be God honoring. It can be showing up to the foot of God going, God, you know my needs, but I'm still gonna tell you because you appreciate your children running to you. Will you bow your heads? I don't know what each person in this room needs to do as far as their consistency in prayer, but I would just challenge you right now, tell God what you need. Tell God what you need. And maybe you're here and you've said, I, that I've never really prayed before. This God thing isn't really for me. God doesn't wanna just take care of your circumstances today. He wants to take care of your eternity. And the beauty of of the Bible and the beauty of our God is that he says, if you just call to me in desperation, you've tried everything else, you just need a savior. You can't do it on your own. Call to me and I'll be there. I'll save you. There's a simple way. Well, how I learned to do it as a six-year-old was ABCs. Admit that you're a sinner. God, I need your help. Believe that he was God, that Jesus was God. And confess that he's the Lord, he's the one in charge of your life. And the Bible says that if you confess that, he will save you. If you've done that today, man, we'd love to celebrate with you. We'd love for you to grab a connection card, to talk to someone at Next Steps. There is nothing more exciting than someone putting their faith in Jesus for the first time. I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna, we're gonna have the opportunity to sing together, but I challenge you to just keep telling God. Maybe you need to close your eyes. Maybe you just need to tell God, God, this is what's going on. I know it's been a while. God, I know I put on a front, but you saw through it. I'm gonna pray, and then we'll sing. God, you're good, and I'm so thankful for God, we have access to you. We can walk boldly into the throne of God and receive grace and mercy. And I just pray that right now, our church would be a church of consistent prayers, of often prayers, of returning prayers, that we would have big faith about big things that matter, but we would also have faith about everything, trusting that you'll come through, trusting that you are who you say you are, trusting that you're good, God. We love you. We thank you in your holy name, amen. Let's stand together and let's sing.